let us pray. God of all life and each life, you created us in love to enjoy your presence in creation. You made us in your image so that we would find purpose and possibility in our lives. You gave us Sabbath rest to breathe in your grace and peace week by week. In Jesus, you show us how to share grace and peace with one another. Refresh us now in this time of worship so that we may leave with a deep sense of well-being at our core. We offer ourselves to you through Christ our Savior. Amen. Would you join me in our prayer of confession? God of joy and life, we come to you as a people hungry for good news. You have given us your word to direct us in the way of life. You have poured out your Holy Spirit so that we can be born to new life as your children. Yet, O oh God, we confess that the ways of the world have a strong attraction and that we often succumb to their lure. Give us the vision and courage to choose and nurture life so that we may receive your blessing. Amen. Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Friends, trust that peace and forgiveness are God's gift to us this day and every day. Be renewed by the power of the Spirit that, renew, that moves with each of us. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our responsive reading is Psalm 81. Let's read the word of God together. Our strength, shout aloud to the God of Jacob. Begin the music, strike the tempo, play the melodious harp and lyre. Sound the ram's horn at the new moon, and when the moon is full on the day of our festival. This is the decree of Israel, the ordinance of the God of Jacob. When God went out against Egypt, he established it as a statue through Joseph. I heard an unknown voice call. In your distress you called and I rescued you. I answered you out of a thundercloud. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Hear me, my people, and I will warn you, if you would only listen to me, Israel. You shall not have no foreign god among you. You shall not worship any god other than me. As we come to hear the word of God, let us pray. God of word and wisdom, you teach us ways that lead to healing and hope. Send your spirit to open our minds and hearts to your word and wisdom, so that we may know your healing and live in the hope that only comes through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Uh, today's uh, word is in two parts. We're going to hear Deuteronomy and uh, Mark. The first reading is Deuteronomy on page 177, chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. 
Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. The second reading is from the Gospel of Mark on page 970 in your pew Bibles, chapter 2, 23 through chapter 3, verse 6. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read that David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abraham, no, sorry, in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, God. A man challenged another to an all-day wood chopping contest. The challenger worked very hard, stopping only for a brief lunch break. The other man had a leisurely lunch and took several other breaks during the day. And at the end of the day, the challenger was surprised and kind of annoyed to find that the other fellow had chopped substantially, substantially more wood than he had. I don't get it, he said. Every time I checked, you were taking a rest and you still chopped more wood than I did. But what you didn't notice, said the winning woodsman, was that I was sharpening my ax each time I sat down to rest. It seems appropriate on this first Sunday in June and as the summer months approach that we hear from both the Old and New Testaments on the importance of Sabbath rest, and the importance of taking rest that renews us, that sharpens our metaphorical axes. Rest is important. As Jesus reminds us, the Sabbath is created for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. In Deuteronomy, we find the second time that the commandments or the law are presented to God's people. And within it, this instruction to observe the Sabbath day and to keep it holy as the Lord God commanded you. For six days you shall labor, but the seventh day is the Sabbath and you shall not do any work. Everyone shall observe the Sabbath. Absolutely everyone, your children, your livestock, your visitors, your immigrants, your servants, your slaves. Everyone shall have rest on the Sabbath. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there. 
Remember that when you were enslaved, there was a time when you were under an authority that didn't relent, an authority who dictated every minute of every day. There was a time when you were not free, but the Lord has brought you out and set you free. So honor the Sabbath. This is the crux of the commandment as it's given in Deuteronomy. In Exodus, we find that the direction is more related to God resting on the seventh day of creation. So between the two, we get this beautiful broad picture of the importance of rest and renewal and the freedom that comes in Sabbath rest. To keep the Sabbath becomes an opportunity for God's people to remember the freedom that they had received. More importantly, an opportunity to remember the freedom of, that the freedom came from God, not themselves. It is a commandment to set aside the things that are currently distracting them and to reconnect with the one who provides. Most importantly, here in Deuteronomy, we hear this extended instruction that the freedom of rest be available to the whole community. It's phrased as a commandment, but it's really a gift. It is not based in merit, as if if you worked hard, hard enough or if you've lived long enough, you get to take a rest. But everybody gets to take a rest. It is rooted in the truth of divine grace and blessing. The truth that we belong to a God who saves, a God who sets free over and over again. So the commandment to keep the Sabbath, to take Sabbath rest is clear. It is a day for worship. It is a day for remembering. It is a day for rest. And rest only comes, this Sabbath rest only comes, when we set aside those things which tie us to and bind us up in the busyness of the world around us. Because Sabbath is very much about letting go and being set free, which is actually really hard to do. And it is amazing in light of how hard it is to do that, how quickly we as a human species are able to take a gift, which is what this is, and to organize it into an obligation, which is what we see has become of the Sabbath by the time that Jesus shows up on the scene. We know that sin can and is measured in our failures to keep the commandments, but it is also measured by the ways in which we become estranged and separated from God when we become convinced that God only loves us by how well we keep the commandments. We cannot control God's love for us. We cannot measure God's love by what we do. God's love for us is a gift. We cannot determine God's love for us either by keeping the commandments or by breaking them. In our gospel reading, we find Jesus in yet another clash with the religious leaders. We are very early in the book of Mark, and he has already managed to clash with them over his ability to proclaim forgiveness, over his choice of dinner partners, and now here at the end of chapter two, they are clashing over the correct way to observe the Sabbath, the day of rest. What is initially gifted to God's people as a means of drawing them together as a community, drawing them closer to God, of recentering them, rejuvenating them, and giving them an opportunity to celebrate what God has done with them, done for them rather, all of that gift has been turned into a legalistic obligation by which the people's faithfulness is measured. In other words, the seventh day, to go back to the two woodcutters, that is meant to be a time that is gifted to sharpen their axes, although that would have been considered work, so metaphoric axes, um, but this idea that they could be rested and refreshed both spiritually, physically, mentally, and relationally, had become a day where the strict observance of rest had become its own type of oppression and enslavement, the very thing that they were invited to remember that God had freed them from. 
The gift had become a burden. And so stringent application of the laws of the Sabbath has allowed the hungry to go hungry and the wounded to go uncared for unless they were at immediate risk of death, in which case anyone can break almost any commandment for the purposes of saving a life. That's different. But if your hunger or your wounds were not going to kill you that day, you could wait till the next day. And then the commandments would be honored. So strict Sabbath observance, like so many other things in religious life, became a measure by which they judged each other instead of a way to draw themselves together in celebration of freedom. They judged each other both in terms of their righteousness and their worthiness on receiving even the most basic of life's necessities. <coughs> So, because of their previous run-ins, and with all of this understanding of Sabbath behind them, the Pharisees have got their eyes on Jesus. They are watching him to make sure that he doesn't put a toe out of line, to make sure that he doesn't corrupt the faithful with his dangerous ideas. They are watching to see what he does next. And we're going to see there are two incidents on the Sabbath as examples. But before we get into the text, one important thing, particularly as it relates to Sabbath keeping, I think that we need to remember about the Pharisees. In scripture and in the church, the Pharisees are presented as the antagonists and they are painted with a very broad brush. <coughs> Sorry, they are a caricature that e emphasizes their most significant flaws. Like every caricature, there is truth in there, but it is important for us to remember that in many ways, more ways than we would like to admit, the Pharisees were very much the first century Jewish equivalents of upstanding Bible-believing pillars of the community. They wanted to love God by their adherence to the law. They believed that the more closely they could follow the law, the more they were ultimately loving God and loving neighbor. They believed that the way it had always been done was the most correct, most faithful way to do it. And they sought to uphold the highest standards of the faith, and they truly believed that it was for the benefit of society as a whole. As with anything, there's corruption in there too. That's another story for another day. But we are a lot more like the Pharisees than we would often care to admit. That I encourage you to just remember before we want to write this Pharisees off um, full stop. But to the story. The scene in the first interaction is as basic as they come. Jesus and his friends are walking past a field and some of the disciples are observed plucking some heads of grain. The text doesn't tell us if it's because they were hungry or if it was simply an absent-minded gesture on their part. But the way the Pharisees are interpreting Sabbath and the law, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter why they are picking it, only that they are. And I've always been fascinated by the Pharisees out there on the Sabbath playing detective, looking to catch Jesus and his disciples out, which, if we wanted to get legalistic, sounds a lot like work to me. But there they are. And Jesus' defense is a retelling of an incident in which David feeds himself and his companions with consecrated bread reserved for the priests. Interestingly, he doesn't quite tell the whole story which probably made his point more clearly to the Pharisees than it even would to us. But in response to the Pharisees' accusation that the disciples had been engaging in the equivalent of a full-scale harvest for commercial purposes on the Sabbath, Jesus asserts that the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. It's a great argument because the religious leaders would have trouble refuting that claim, but they would also have trouble articulating the way that their application was upholding it. 
Then, on the Sabbath, in the synagogue, Jesus comes upon a man with a withered hand. Instead of focusing their attention on the Sabbath worship that was certainly underway, some of the Pharisees are giving Jesus and his friends the side eye, watching to see what he does next. Again, with the Pharisees working as detectives on the Sabbath and in their zeal to enforce the right way of resting and worshiping, their attention has been directed not to God and what God has done for them, but to Jesus and what he may or may not be doing in the back corner of the room to improve the quality of life of a fellow human being. Noticing their stares, Jesus asks them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? Is it lawful to save a life or to kill? And the Pharisees don't have an answer because it is absolutely lawful to save a life on the Sabbath. That's an easy answer to give. But the problem is that in their legalistic interpretations, good becomes highly subjective. Ultimately, because the man was not going to succumb immediately to whatever was going on with his hand, the religious stance was that it could wait until tomorrow. It didn't, healing his hand didn't meet the threshold for necessary good to be done today on the Sabbath. Keeping the Sabbath was more important than doing that little bit of good. In frustration, and with only a word, Jesus heals the man, and the Pharisees go out and immediately conspire with others against him. Chapter 3 of Mark's Gospel, and already the religious leaders have gone from skeptical to murderous. And it is very much downhill from there. So whether the issue is hunger or healing, for Jesus, the satisfaction of human need trumps reverent religiosity every time. We will later hear him say that he didn't come to abolish the law. So Sabbath is still important, but he came to fulfill it. To bring God's people to a closeness with God that the law could not. To allow God's people to experience the intent of the law in new and life-giving ways. In fulfilling the law, Jesus injects something new into the old like new fermenting wine bursting old wineskins. And predictably, the defenders of the status quo, those upstanding pillars of the community, don't like it because it is different and it is uncomfortable and it is a new way of doing things, and so they mobilize against him. I was born after the Lord's Day Act was repealed at the national level. I have some memories of stores being closed on Sundays in my very early childhood, but for all intents and purposes, my children are second generation in this world where life goes on in the secular world on Sundays. I don't remember not being able to go to the grocery store on Sundays, and my children certainly don't. And so what does that mean now, several generations after that huge change in our societal practice? for Sabbath. What does keeping Sabbath look like now? If we are looking at Jesus fulfilling the law, honoring this importance of recognizing and taking and accepting this gift of rest, seeing it as an opportunity to revive ourselves in our connection with God and with others, what does Sabbath look like today? What does it mean and how can we receive this commandment for Sabbath rest in the way it was intended, but in a new way that fits our current context? A gift that allows us to rest in the goodness of God, to be blessed and to be reminded of the truth of our existence, that we exist not because we have earned it or because we have done all of the right things, but because God has created us. I don't have a specific answer on what Sabbath looks like in today's context. But what if instead of seeing it as an obligation to keep and to enforce, we understood Sabbath as the instruction to take a break from our need to run the show? For many of us, work is a way 
or for, for many of us, yeah, it's true. For many of us, work is a way of self-salvation and self-justification. Definitely, that is what society has trained us to believe. We try to prove to God, try to prove to others, we try to prove to ourselves that we are good people on the basis of what we do and achieve. So what if to start, our Sabbath rest gave us an opportunity to just let that go? We do not need to run the show. What if we took time, intentional time, to simply allow ourselves to do less, to remind ourselves that we are loved, forgiven, and accepted by God, not because of what we do, but because of who we are through faith in Jesus Christ? What if our Sabbath rest, our Sabbath observance, instead of being a chore, was understood as an opportunity to sharpen our minds, our bodies, our spirits, our metaphorical axes, so that when we do return to our work, because we will return to our work, that rest that we have intentionally taken is a rest that sets us free from striving, a rest that sets us free from our sense of identity and worth being tied up in our performance. In taking time out, from whatever work defines us to the world, we slowly start to disentangle our sense of worth, which is so often caught up in that identity, and it allows us to reorient ourselves to God who loves us. What if our Sabbath rest was received not as restrictive practice, but one which encouraged us to simply be as we are, forgiven, loved, and free. We are free to rest because we are not the most important thing. We are not the ones who do the saving. We are the ones who are saved. So whenever and however we take our Sabbath rest, let it be in ways which reorient our attention towards God, ways which do good not only for ourselves but for our neighbors ways which do good for strangers and friends. Let our Sabbath rest remind us that the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, and that the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. Amen. Let us pray. God of communion and community, we give you thanks for our life together in Christ and for the work of the Spirit that draws us closer to you and to each other. We pray for the life of our church, for the Presbyterian Church in Canada as it meets in General Assembly throughout the next days. Spend, send your Spirit to work in and through the commissioners, opening minds and hearts to your leading. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ sustain us in communion and in community, even when we differ over decisions and directions. God of compassion and concern, thank you for the ministries and mission Presbyterians undertake together in Canada and throughout this world that you love. Thank you for lessons learned and hope inspired by all the partners that we have worked with in different cultures and on different projects. We pray for all who serve in ministries supported by Presbyterians sharing and Presbyterian world service and development. Open our hearts to support their work with generous giving and ongoing prayer so that lives will be healed, transformed and strengthened according to your compassionate concern and in the name of Jesus Christ. God of our hearts and our hopes, we pray for those you have given us to love. Hear us as we name those who are known to us, who are sick in mind, body, and spirit, in the silence of our hearts. We pray for those who serve our nation and communities as leaders in business and politics, in healthcare and education, in military, peacekeeping, and all emergency services. Grant them wisdom and resilience when resources are stretched. May at all times and in all places, their choices address the needs of the most vulnerable 
and be guided by your wisdom and justice. We pray for those who face uncertainty, unrest, and threat from violence day by day. Lord, we name before you people in our own community and those places around the world where injustice and deprivation are unrelenting. We pray for places in conflict, places suffering from famine and disaster, for those who fear their livelihoods due to fire and drought, for those in Panama who are preparing to evacuate as rising seawaters threaten their existence on an island. God of the earth and all its fullness, in this season of planting and growing, of nesting and nurturing, we pray for the environment and all creatures it supports. Protect species and habitats at risk and make us better stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. Lord, hear our prayers for everything and everyone that you hold precious. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest with you this day and forevermore. Amen.